Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Department of Physics at Chalmers. And uh, well, my name is Thomas Nilsson, head of the department and chairman of this uh, public defense. And today we have uh, Simon Lindberg presenting his doctoral thesis entitled Charge Storage Mechanisms and Interactions of Hybrid Supercapacitor Electro Materials with Next Generation Electrolytes. And uh, we are Happy to have with us via Zoom, we hope, the appointed faculty opponent, Dr. Stefan Freundberger from the IST Austria, Vienna. We also have uh, three members of the examination committee, Dr. Olivier Krosny uh, at the University of Nantes in France. We are here in the room, Associate Professor Björn Wickman, the Department of Physics, and also connected by Zoom, uh, Principal Scientist Dr. Anna M. Andersson from ABB Corporate Research in Sweden. There's also a deputy member of the PhD Examination Committee, Professor Eva Olsson of the Department of Physics, and I think she's also connected via Zoom as a backup. Uh, I should mention a few other uh, key persons here. Uh, the main supervisor of this thesis work is uh, Professor Alexander Matic, present in the room, and the examiner is Professor Patrick Johansson, also present. So a few words on the proceedings. Uh, but first of all, we did start somewhat late due to uh, some technical problems, especially with the sound. And I urge everyone following us on Zoom or YouTube to, uh, to use the chat functions if something fails, if you have technical problems in following the proceedings of the defense. Uh, we will first have I will first give the word to Simon, and then we will have an uh, introduction to the topic by the opponent, the faculty opponent, Dr. Freundberger. Uh, then Simon will present his work, this work. Following that, we will have a short leg stretcher, five minutes, and then come back for the questions and answers part of the session. So with this, I give the word to Simon. Yes, please. So thank you very much. Uh, yes, so welcome everybody. So I think we can uh, go straight ahead to uh, Professor von Leyer's introduction. So let's me see if we can get the, get the technical uh, issues working here. So maybe you can, can you share the screen? Uh, should I uh, bring up my presentation? Yes. Yes. Can you see it? Uh, is it visible for everyone? Yes. Yeah, okay. So uh, I was asked to give a short overview of the, the overall context of the thesis, uh, a bit beyond the direct te technical content. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me go a little bit into the energy storage landscape. Uh, so I sneak this graph from a quite uh, well known paper from uh, Dunn and Taraskon. So, what is, is shown here on, on the lower axis, and uh, it should be noted that this is a double logarithmic scale. So, the lower axis is uh, the system power, uh, also depending on the module size. And so, this goes quite wide. Uh, quite wide. I mean, actually, you can go to much lower powers even. But, uh, so up to gigawatts from kilowatts. 
And so there, you see there's, uh, and, and then on the uh, vertical axis, you have the, the time over which the systems can uh, give this power. And so uh, what you see kind of a general thing is that they are very uh, different technologies and sort of they go in, in, in a diagonal. And so uh, more the, the, the chemical uh, storage systems, they're, they're centered around here. Um, there's a mechanical one with high, flower, uh, high power fly leaf. And then uh, for, for really bulk power management, we, we go to uh, also let's say, mechanical. So, and where we uh, super cups, what uh, Simon's thesis is about uh, Camus is, is around here. So what you see is also they, they cover quite a, a wide range uh, anyway of uh, power and uh, discharge time. So, so here on the, the lower end, we have a high power super cups, so they, they only deliver this for, for a short time and uh, others which are more uh, suited for high energy applications. But of course, uh, you can think of uh, adapting them to anywhere in between. So uh, how can they look like when they are in uh, commercial modules? Uh, these are just uh, non-comprehensive examples of uh, some pictures of commercial modules, like uh, this is a, a company, Skeleton Tech, another well-known company, uh, Maxwell. So generally, they, they look sort of like a, a battery, cylindric in, in many cases, and they are uh, assembled to mod modules. And uh, where they are then used, uh, like in energy management, so as as they are suited for uh, higher energies, uh, sorry, uh, higher powers, uh, they, they can actually go in between uh, the more bulk energy storage, like in, in batteries, uh, for example, in, in the storage of renewables, uh, and then in, for the use of uh, households and uh, Another one is uh, electromobility. Uh, so also this is an, an just a random example, let's say, for electric buses, which are charged, for example, in, in, in stations and then only need to run for, for not all too long distance. Uh, so meaning charging needs to be relatively fast, but the energy doesn't have to be that much to, to reach the next station. Or also uh, an application which is, is more emerging um, is like so-called variable electronics where like a super cup type storage can be directly uh, integrated into uh, fibers to make textiles for example so this much about applications so then uh, i thought it would be nice to, to to go a bit into what they call elementary considerations and and uh, how we uh, put uh, and electrochemical energy storage in general, and, and here, of course, more uh, guided to the super cups in, in general, uh, in terms of what elements we want to use, uh, because we have a, so this is the periodic table of the elements, and we can in principle use any if, if we think they are useful. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, when it comes then to, to really uh, useful elements, they, they break down into not all too many. So uh, what we have in, in uh, typically in terms of mobile ions, uh, so like uh, lithium sodium, we have this in batteries and we also will find this in, in the, in the supercups, uh, lithium sodium ions, uh, then carbon we find a lot. Uh, then these are often elements uh, which make up the electrolyte. And then uh, what, uh, Simon will present afterwards. If you want to have some more redox uh, activity inside, then often you come back to, to elements out of the transition metals like titanium, vanadium, we will find uh, manganese. Uh, and all those are also used in batteries. And uh, so there is no, and I hope we'll discuss them a bit later, there's not uh, too much strict boundary actually between battery and, and uh, super cups and or hybrid super cups, uh, also in terms of the elements used. And as a general guideline, 
what we should actually do, and then I mean, and, and when we want to commercialize them. Uh, finally, it also comes down to not only to performance, which is uh, a, a lot at the, the content of the research work uh, in this thesis, but also we want finally sustainability and cost. And cost is often uh, naturally very um, connected to sustainability because if we have non-abundant elements, they will be expensive. Uh, and so uh, this is one important point that we use abundant elements and they are actually around here. Uh, like uh, lithium is not that abundant, so better maybe sodium or, or the divalent. Uh, then another important point is e-coefficient synthesis of the materials we use. Uh, typically, uh, when we use these transition metals around here, uh, the energy input to, to uh, make these materials and also to, uh, to recycle them will be higher. So, so the, the performance in increase as we uh, use this, these elements. Uh, also always comes at, at the cost of, of uh, higher energy input into uh, manufacturing and recyclability. Uh, so we'll need to take this trade-off into account. Uh, so there are many representations of periodic tables of elements regarding um, properties uh, so we can uh, I, I found very nice uh, presentations uh, representations uh, like just to, to show what one can do for example so this is um, uh, one property electron affinity of the certain elements so the, the bigger the, the, the box the, the higher the value and this is just in order to, uh, to illustrate how this is, is done because when it comes then down to uh, elemental ab abundance, what, what is so important for sustainability and cost, uh, the periodic table looks like this. Uh, so the elements that we find also then in the supercups like uh, aluminium for current collectors or the carbon, which would be up here. Uh, and, and also the titanium is not too bad choice. And then also maybe sodium is better than this. Okay, so this is what I wanted to present in terms of the, the background and um, uh, this much from my side. Thank you very much. And I'm going to continue with uh, Simon's presentation of his thesis. Yes. Work. Yes, so thank you very much, Stefan, for that uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, so I will uh, go ahead to the introduction. Some of this was already mentioned, but uh, uh, the importance of energy storage. Uh, but uh, really to stress that, uh, uh, that uh, the battery research today uh, is, uh, is mostly focused on, on increasing energy density. However, energy density, as we saw, is not, not the only thing that matters. Uh, for many applications, we also want uh, high power. We want to f uh, charge our car as fast as possible. Uh, so, so for these kind of applications, we need a new approach. Uh, and, um, and that approach uh, could be supercapacitors, which are high power devices, but they struggle with the low, uh, with the low energy density. Uh, however, supercapacitors do have some applications, as we saw. Uh, I want to mention uh, a couple of more. Uh, Stefan men talked about these flash chargers for buses. Uh, this uh, picture here is taken from uh, is taken from Switzerland. Uh, they also uh, they can also be used in other more specialized applications, such as airbags, avalanche airbags for off-piste off -piste skiers, uh, but also for brake energy. Um, uh, absorption in the new Lamborghini Sian. Uh, and Stefan presented one way of, uh, of describing the, um, uh, of, of comparing different, uh, um, different energy storage uh, te uh, techniques. Uh, this is another way of plotting the power density versus energy density. Uh, and uh, as you can see in the 
uh, in the upper corner here, we have uh, high power density, but very low energy density. And on the other end of the scale, we have a very high energy density, but a low power density. Uh, and we saw that we have some some uh, modules that exist today, and they normally exist, uh, they normally operate uh, around here. Um, and uh, uh, however, to reach into more applications, uh, the energy density needs to be improved. Uh, and one number that has been stated is around 16 watt hours per kilogram for the automotive industry, which is quite big. So it would be interesting to, to make uh, contributions in that area. And that's why next generation supercapacitors uh, should have an energy density above that, but still have a high, higher power density than the traditional lithium ion batteries. So how do we increase the energy density? Uh, the energy density depends on, on mainly two things. Uh, it depends on the capacity of the material in the electrode. So by adding high capacity materials, we can increase the energy density. Uh, and it also depends on the operation voltage window, uh, as we can see in this uh, equation here. Uh, and here, I want to make a quick, uh, uh, a small remark here that uh, when C in this equation is actually the capacitance, uh, which is a number used for traditionally used for carbon materials. However, in this uh, in this work here, we mainly work on capacity as a way to measure charge, and that's the uh, and that's how we characterize our materials. Uh, so my research approach is kind of like taking the foundation in in what has been done before. So uh, traditionally, uh, high capacity materials uses aqueous electrolytes for for it being cheap. Uh, safe and have a high conductivity. However, they struggle with the low uh, potential window, with a narrow potential window, and thus reducing the energy density of the device. Uh, another approach used today is our so-called organic electrolytes. They have a larger potential window. However, they are also flammable uh, and uh, high capacity materials such as manganese oxide often suffer a lower uh, capacity in these electrolytes. Um, so how can we combine these? Uh, so my, my research approach is to combine this kind of high capacity or Faradaic electrode materials that we will see later with electrochemically stable electrolytes. Uh, the approach has been, uh, as Stefan pointed out, the importance to have a cheap and abundant uh, re, um, materials uh, for their uh, electrode materials. And, um, and this we try in combination with two different types of electrolytes, ionic liquid electrolytes or highly concentrated electrolytes. So when we add this type of high capacity material to, uh, to our electrodes, we, make a, we, make it, we turn it into a so-called hybrid supercapacitor. So a hybrid supercapacitor on one side is a traditional supercapacitor using carbon materials, uh, such as activated carbon, AC, or carbon nanofibers which are two examples of carbon materials. And if we look, uh, and they, uh, and activated carbons have this type of porous structure, as we can see here, while carbon, and they have a high surface area, while carbon nanofibers often have a slightly lower surface area, but they instead have other properties, such as being self-standing and have a, have a high conductivity. Uh, typical capacitances of these materials are around 120 to 300 farads per gram. Uh, however, it's also important to note that Carbon in general has a low density, meaning that we can achieve quite good gravimetric capacitance, but, uh, but the volumetric capacitance can be quite poor. Um, one example uh, of, of performance of such materials is carbon derived from coconut shells, which has uh, uh, energy density of around 35 watt hours and a uh, uh, power density of around 30 kilowatt hours per kilogram. And this might sound like it's, uh, like it's a good performing material. However, when we turn it into a module, uh, the resulting energy and power is instead around two watt hours and two kilowatt hours per kilogram. Uh, so we see that there is a need for improvement. Uh, so that's why we add this type of high capacity materials or Faradaic materials, as I will re refer to it from now on. Uh, which store in which charge is stored directly through electrolyte interaction and not just by the formation of double layers as in carbon. Uh, some theoretical capacitances of uh, some of these uh, ferritic materials are around 1,500 for ruthenium oxide and uh, 1,400 for manganese oxide. Uh, and an example of such a device is, for example, 
in this case, uh, consisting of a molybdenum disulfide composite with a graphene electrode, with a uh, graphene anode. And, um, and there you reach around 100 watt hours and 10 kilowatt hours per kilogram of electrodes. Uh, so you can get quite an improvement. Um, However, not only the electrodes are interesting, we also talked about the electrolytes. So in this case, uh, first I want to introduce the ionic liquid electrolytes. And the reason manganese oxide is believed to have a lower ca capacity in organic electrolytes compared to in aqueous electrolytes is attributed to the lack of proton interaction with the electrolytes. Uh, so that's why we, in this case, investigate different, uh, different levels of proton activity. Um, for the ionic liquid start. And in most cases, we use this, um, uh, this type of uh, aprotic TFSI anion. And I should also mention that ionic liquids are essentially molten salts. Uh, so it consists of an ion ion and a cation. So the anion, we normally use this TFSI, and then we combine it with different cations. So in one example, one example here is the emium cation, which is an aprotic cation, meaning that we don't have any uh, proton activity of this ion. Uh, it, and that results in a relatively high pKa value. Uh, it has um, a relatively low viscosity being in an ionic liquid and a quite decent conductivity for it being in an ionic, ionic liquid. And an average uh, um, potential window, uh, electrochemical chemical stability uh, window. However, if we compare this with a traditional electrolyte, in this, in this case, uh, sulfuric acid, we see that sulfuric acid has a much higher pKa value being uh, an acid. Uh, it has a substantially lower viscosity and 100 times higher conductivity than the ionic liquid. However, the potential window is only 1.23. Um, so we, we wanted to investigate the proton activity of the different electrolytes. And um, doing that, we, we changed some of the functional groups attacked, uh, attached to the ions. So in this case, we used, we compared it to a so-called protic ionic liquid, which means that we've exchanged the methyl group to a single proton, leading to a lower pKa value, but still it's relatively high compared to sulfuric acid. And the conductivity uh, goes down, viscosity goes up, and it has a slightly more narrow potential window. Yet it's still more stable than the sulfuric acid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then finally, we choose something in between, a so-called Brunstedt acid, which has a functional group attached, which is then uh, slight, which has a, a higher proton activity than the aprotic, and but a lower than the protic ionic liquid. Uh, so these were the different cations that we used. Uh, we also wanted to investigate uh, the anion, uh, so we changed the aprotic TF cyanion to the uh, to a Brunstedt acid HSO4, and for you you know a little bit of chemistry, you see that this is very similar to our sulfuric acid. It's the monodeprotonated sulfuric acid. Uh, however, it has, a, um, it has still a higher pKa value than the, uh, than, the H, uh, than the sulfuric acid, but it has the lowest of the, of the other ones. And, but you can see here some other negative things is that the viscosity now is reaching the consistency of honey and uh, the conductivity is going down even further. Uh, and it, but it still has a moderate uh, electrochemical stability window. Uh, so if we look then at the other approach, so-called highly concentrated electrolytes, uh, for, for most electrolytes that are used today, uh, um, a low concentration is used of the salt. And that leads to high conductivity, a low viscosity, but also a very narrow stability window. Uh, if we increase the conductivity and use the salt wisely, we can get an even higher conductivity, still a low viscosity, and increase the electrochemical stability window. Uh, if we increase the concentration further, uh, we see that we can get uh, uh, an even larger stability window, but at the cost of viscosity and conductivity. So for supercapacitor applications, we choose the middle road here to balance the stability with the uh, conductivity and viscosity. Uh, for the electrode materials, we aimed at using abundant and cheap materials. Uh, and one example of this is manganese oxide, which is a very, very well-studied material. Um, it, and it has a high theoretical capacity. Uh, we looked at two different structures, the so-called epsilon phase and the alpha phase. And as you can see, the difference between those two, these two materials is that the epsilon phase here has a closed structure 
uh, while the alpha phase has these open channels where you can have uh, cation insertion. Uh, the second material is, is titanium dioxide in the anatase phase. So it has, um, it's also cheap, it's well studied, and it's proven a high power density for both batteries and, uh, and supercapacitor applications. And it also has a higher lithium diffusion coefficient than for manganese oxide. Uh, and finally, we looked at maybe the, um, the least abundant material, vanadium dioxide, in the monoclinic structure. However, it was chosen because it has a high electrical conductivity and it also has a low insulator metal transition temperature, meaning that it could be used for it could be interesting for high temperature applications. Uh, so the research questions in in uh, in, uh, in detail that we used all were based on the under the common interest to investigate the interaction between high capacity electro materials and noble electrolytes. And especially, as I touched upon a little bit already, is the ionic liquid's proton activity affect the charge storage mechanism of MnO2? Uh, and how does the addition of lithium affect the charge storage mechanism um, in different electrolytes? Uh, can using a highly concentrated electrolyte widen the potential window while at the same time increasing the capacity and improve the lifetime of VO2 electrodes. And finally, we also stepped away a little bit from the electrolyte and looked at the morphology of the electrode and how that in affects the interaction with novel electrolytes. Um, so now we move into the results. And the first, uh, the first um, thing to touch on is the, is the interaction between neat ionic liquid and manganese oxide interaction, looking at the protic versus aprotic ionic liquids. Uh, and we see here that these peaks that we uh, that I've encircled um, indicate that we get the Faraday contribution from MnO2. So we get an interaction with the electrolyte to the total charge storage with the protic ionic liquid. And this is shown in paper two, paper three. Um, and the suggested uh, reaction mechanism looks like this, and it's similar to what's been previously reported for other cations such as lithium or sodium. Um, and uh, you see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, in the case of alpha MnO2, the oxidation peak is slightly shifted, and we can see the onset of the reduction peak. Uh, and this is uh, mainly because uh, we, use, um, uh, we use a different potential window in, in the case of alpha MnO2 compared to epsilon MnO2. Uh, we also see already at 20 millivolts per second, we see a tilted CV for these, uh, for these protic ionic liquids, and that indicates that we have a sluggish system. Uh, and as you remember, uh, supercapacitors are high power devices. So, so here we get maybe an idea that this is maybe not to, uh, absolute, um, totally suitable for this type of applications. Um, and for the emium TFSI, the aprotic ionic liquid, we get this type of rectangular shaped CV and that indicates that we only have double layer charge storage. Uh, looking closer onto the interaction between the cation and the MnO2 surface, uh, in paper two, we used ab initio modeling to, to try to model this type of behavior. And we see that we get the strong proton MnO2 interaction with the, uh, with the protic ionic liquid. Um, compared to the aprotic ionic liquid, where we see no interaction uh, uh, at all. Um, and also to try to assess how the ionic liquid um, uh, looks, uh, how the ionic liquid organizes at the surface, we calculate, the, we try to calculate the maximum capacity at full surface coverage of ions uh, using some different um, uh, configurations, such as a standing or a parallel configuration. And we found that the standing configuration shown uh, here we resulted in a in a maximum capacity similar to what we obtained in the experimental results. Um, and now, uh, to, since the aprotic ionic liquid didn't uh, it didn't interact with the, with the MnO2 material, we investigated how the how the addition of lithium um, uh, changed this, and we saw that by change by adding LiTFSI to the uh, aprotic ionic liquid, this, it induces this uh, Faradaic response, uh, also shown in paper two and paper three from the MnO2 material. Uh, and the, in this case, the electrochemical reaction is suggested to look like this. So it's very similar to the one with the, with the protic ionic liquid. However, here lithium is the, is the mediator with the, with the MnO2 surface. 
Um, and we get, in general, broader peaks in, uh, in this case compared to the protic ionic liquid. And this is explained by a slow uh, lithium diffusion in inert layers of enium uh, cations. Uh, and since, since this is uh, slower compared to the, when we have the protic ionic liquid, where the, where the interface layers are already saturated with EIM cations, you get a, a broader peaks and, and a gradual uh, um, saturation of lithium ions at the surface. Um, however, uh, the potential window was also different in the epsilon and alpha amino 2 um, uh, materials. And, and here we want to investigate how the electrolyte composition affects this um, um, affects the amino 2 behavior. Uh, and we see that if we use the aprotic ionic liquid with lithium TFSI, we get a small, we get a small capacity fade over the first 100 cycles and a, and a good, uh, good efficiency. Uh, however, when we use the protic ionic liquid, we see that we get the much lower capacity retention and, um, and um, uh, quite poor efficiency. Uh, so from this, we say that we have, um, we have some kind of dissolution or irreversible change in the surface structure of the manganese oxide material. Um, however, as we saw in the previous CVs, the, uh, the high power performance of these ionic liquids is not great. So to investigate the more realistic electrolytes for room temperature applications, we instead investigated this type of highly concentrated electrolytes. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's the VO2 electrode in a highly concentrated 8 molal sodium TFSI electrolyte. Uh, and uh, we compare this with a more traditional, strongly alkaline 6 molar KOH electrolyte. Uh, and in this, in the lower figures here, we use the KOH electrolyte, and you can see that we have uh, sharp peaks uh, compared to, uh, to, the, um, to the highly concentrated electrolyte. Uh, however, by using the 8 molar sodium TFSI electrolyte, we, get, we enable a 1.2 volt potential window compared to 0 0.5 for the KOH electrolyte. Uh, we also see that we get uh, some additional peaks compared to the KOH, which has uh, uh, only one uh, redox reaction. So here, we, it, it, this indicates that we have maybe uh, that we have more than one redox reaction, uh, and this explains the higher capacity obtained, but also the fast capacity fade that we observe. Uh, here we see that we have a slightly tilted CV at 100, but this is at 100 millivolts per second, so it's five times higher than the ionic liquid, and this is. Uh, compared to the KOH electrolyte, and this is attributed to the lower conductivity of the 8 molar sodium TFSI electrolyte compared to the KOH electrolyte. Um, so far, I've been talking mostly about electrolytes, but we also looked into the electrode and how that affects the, uh, affects the interaction with these novel uh, electrolytes. Um, uh, so, uh, so uh, in one uh, uh, in the first uh, study, we investigated the impact of titanium dioxide morphology and structure on charge storage mechanism. And we used this type of uh, micro bead shaped uh, um, material consisting of nanocrystallites uh, with uh, about 25 nanometer in dimension. And we see that uh, the, electro the unique electrode and ionic, ionic liquid interaction uh, enables these kind of irreversible changes in the CV as investigated in paper four, uh, which has not previously been reported. And it can be characterized as a shift of the peaks um, to lower potentials, but also as the apparent emerging of new peaks. Uh, and these new peaks are, of, are often attributed to that, with, you know, that new phases appear in the material with the different insertion potential of lithium ions. So we, we explain this by the creation of, of new lithium rich phases. Um, however, it doesn't have any um, effect on the capacity, uh, but a lower peak potential is, is generally bad for the high power performance. Um, however, it's uh, not only uh, negative, uh, by using this type of combination, we saw that um, it omits the initial capacity phase seen with the same electrode material, but in the organic LP30 electrolyte. Um, and if we look at the structure uh, at before and after cycling, uh, we see that uh, the structure is retained, but 
the lower peak intensity after cycling uh, is attributed to a larger amorphous fraction of the material. Uh, finally, we also investigated the different, uh, some different, um, two different electrodes, MnO2 electrodes, uh, and especially how the epsilon MnO2 composite affects the energy, the charge storage. So, for the MnO2 composite, it's these type of carbon nanofibers coated with MnO2 material uh, on the surface. Uh, it has a much lower uh, MnO2 content compared to the more traditional alpha MnO2 electrode. Uh, it, the particles are smaller and they are self-standing and they don't need a binder compared to the alpha MnO2, which needs additional binder, which further reduces the conductivity. Uh, and we saw that using a lower MnO2 content and smaller particles increases the electrode conductivity in paper three. And this is shown as a higher relative capacity for, epsilon, for, for the composite compared to the traditional MnO2 electrode. Uh, so some uh, and and but also the MnO2 content must be balanced because even, even if you get a higher uh, capacity, um, higher relative capacity in this case, uh, the actual capacity on the on the whole on the mass of the whole electrode is actually higher in the in the alpha MnO2 case. Uh, so some uh, conclusions, uh, we found, I found that the hydrogen bond forming ability of the protic ionic liquid enables a, a Faraday contribution from the MnO2 material compared to the aprotic ionic liquid. Um, and it's the, um, the same uh, way that the addition of lithium ions to the aprotic ionic liquid enables Faraday contribution. Um, that there must be a blocking layer of enium cations preventing the lithium ions from reaching the surface fast. Uh, and using a highly concentrated electrolyte, we enable more redox states and increasing the capacity, but it also reduces the cycle lifetime of the material. And the morphologies uh, of the electron material also plays an important role in, in important properties, such as lifetime capacity and high power performance. Uh, so as for the outlook, uh, the first thing that I would be interested in to investigate in so is our different types of in situ measurements, such as EXAFs and or RAMA spectroscopy on different MnO2 and ionic liquid systems, and to compare and see if it behaves as M uh, MnO2 in more conventional electrolytes. Um, and also, uh, so far, we only looked at one protic ionic liquid. However, there are other protic ionic liquids that also could be tested to further investigate what, um, what properties affects the charge storage mechanism of MnO2. Uh, also, the addition of solvents could be interesting on the lithium diffusion. Um, but not only experiments to model and simulate the behavior of the interfaces, of both highly concentrated electrolytes and ionic liquids could be interesting uh, to explain this type of behavior that we saw. Um, and also all these measurements were done at room temperature. Ionic liquids have the, the benefit of, uh, uh, of being stable at high temperatures. Uh, so it could be, it, it could be interesting to, to do more high temperature devices and see also in combination with the monoclinic VO2 uh, using a self-standing electrode with both ionic liquid and highly concentrated electrolytes. Uh, and also, finally, uh, investigating other electrodes, uh, such as conducting polymers. And if so far the interaction has been mainly with the cation, it would be interesting to, to identify if we can find uh, a material that interacts with the anion. Uh, and also, if the high capacity of the titanium dioxide anatase can in LP30 can combine can be combined with the lower capacity fade with EMIM TFSI. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank my co-workers in the, the Matic group, uh, and especially Professor Alexander Matic, who has supervised me over these uh, uh, five years, uh, but also uh, the PJ group, which I have been a part of, and my examiner, uh, Professor Patrick Johansson. Uh, but also I would like to thank the uh, the carbon group at the University of Pretoria that uh, accepted me uh, during five years, uh, during four months uh, in 2018. Uh, and with that, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, we will now have a short length stretcher and uh, return in uh, five minutes to 10. To continue the oh, okay, thanks. See you soon.
Yes. Okay, so welcome back, and we continue the defense, and I now give the word to the faculty opponent, please. Can we have the presentation back? I think it is sometimes uh, good to, uh, for discussing it, uh, sometimes the figures, and if you go, for example, on slide three. Slide three? Yeah. Uh, one more, uh, yes, yeah. So, you, for the commercial systems, you, you uh, mark three commercial systems with stars. Yes. Uh, uh, like, if, if you uh, investigate super cups, then you always do it by uh, over different rates, and then you get this type of uh, uh, better results. Of, in the Ragone plot, you get this type of banana-shaped uh, range of, uh, of energy and power density. And for these three commercial products, are these always at, this, at the same conditions or are they different conditions? Because they, they are quite different in, in where they are located in this plot. Are they, the conditions comparable? Uh, I think so. I, I'm not an expert in these commercials, but when I looked, when I started looking around at the homepage, they always said like they had this impedance matched uh, performance, and they had some um, realistic impedance matched performance for um, for comparison and a realistic uh, performance. So I chose this uh, impedance without really being maybe 100 percent sure what that actually means but it's mm. somehow like it must be some kind of um, um, setup where they can actually compare the um, uh, compare the um, uh, the systems with each other i guess but mm. there was not, there was not a lot of i mean it was only rated it only gave me one power and one one yeah. energy density so it doesn't give me like a range when i looked mm. at the skeleton text homepage for example yeah. But then I think this is uh, a, a general problem, like is what is recognized between industry and academia, that there is not the same language of comparing things. Uh, and uh, like that there is, um, there is also this one famous comment by Patrice Simon, and I think Yuri Kokotsi, uh, about the, um, where they show that uh, some uh, like graphene-based supercups to have a really Stellar performance based on the active material mass, but actually the, 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 the thing the electrodes were so thin and then it's still so fluffy that if you account also the weight of the current collector and everything, uh, they, they, they just uh, they very uh, low performance in, in uh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we, had, we had a visitor here at, at Chalmers and uh, and I asked. Her that worked at Volvo and asked her if she if she had looked into supercapacitors for for uh, buses and she commented that they were too bulky. They might be they were not uh, very heavy, but they were too bulky to, to mm. be put in buses. So that is a real problem, and and so the density is quite uh, is important. So it's more the volumetric uh, value which is yeah. critical in many applications. Yeah. And. So if you look at this, uh, the, the three commercial products, do, do you know what, I mean, they, they differ quite, uh, quite a lot. And actually, uh, what is nice, that they inc increase in both properties, both in power and in energy. Yeah. Do you know what, what are the, the main advances from one, day, from one to the other? It's a little bit secret. I, I, I've yeah, seen, yeah. I've seen. It's a little bit like hush hush. But I've seen the skeleton tech uh, presentation, and he didn't really want to tell which electrolyte they used. But I know that they use a patented uh, uh, graphene uh, type of carbon for their electrodes. That's as far as I know. Uh, and I think that Maxwell uses this type of coconut derived activated carbon. I think. So it's a little bit different. It feels like Skeleton Tech maybe has spent more time on their, uh, on developing like a, like a unique uh, carbon, while while Maxwell used this type of activated carbon that's uh, that's already on the market. And, and the, the other thing is, uh, I mean, you, you have shown a quite impressive uh, 
uh, thing when, when you look at the, the energy uh, per per mass of, of electron material and then to the module level. No? So you come from 35 watt hours per kilo to two. Yeah. So uh, one actually wonders whether how much is actually in the engineering. Yeah. To, to, to avoid as much as possible uh, non-active material uh, rather than uh, going to new chemistry. I mean, a new yeah. Here. Yeah, I think I think if there's if, if for for a good engineer, I mean, it's the same for batteries. I think they work a lot mm -hmm. trying to make them more compact and like to avoid dead space. So I think yeah, I think that's also very important. Uh, so I think that at least in that paper by uh, that review paper on the industrial applications of supercapacitors, they say that it's both developing new materials, but also uh, to just uh, assemble them more more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think if it, it was the same when you look at lithium ion batteries, the, since the first introduction, the chemistry, uh, still the, the first chemistry is still around, but uh, with the same chemistry, uh, the energy, uh, I think for sure, has more than much more than doubled. Yeah. And it was uh, simply by engineering. And uh, it, it's even more placative with lithium ion batteries. There are so many. Always, you see so also many papers with new promising materials uh, published, and in the end, it's it's five materials which are commercial and yeah. <laughs> the first ever. Yeah. And, uh, so I think there's a lot of uh, still in, uh, hidden in the engineering, no? and it will be the same for the super tops. Yeah, it could be that in the ten years we still they still use activated carbon, but they made an efficient way to to pack it better. Could be that. Could be like that. Yeah. Because uh, uh, do you have an idea also in, in your own electrodes, what's the, the porosity which you have to backfill with electrolyte? Because electrolyte typically has some similar density than the carbon. So if you have very fluffy electrodes, you will fill in lots of electrolyte, which uh, of course it's a sort of active component, but uh, still it adds, I think, a lot of weight. And, and um, if, uh, it's in your thesis on, on, on figure four. Uh, anyway, it's, it's about uh, surface and surface uh, active redox materials. And so, uh, how would you describe the, the difference between? Uh, surface active redox material and, and pure uh, double layer capacitance because in, in either case it's limited by the uh, ion arrangement on the on the surface and, and why can ion uh, redox surface active redox material store so much more than pure double layer capacitance so what's the mechanistic origin uh. I would say that uh, in in double layer capacitance, it it strictly de or it depends mostly on the on the surface area. You get like um, you get one electron per like a surf like an area. In the case of the um, of the um, Faradaic material, you get the direct uh, interaction with the uh, with the electrolyte. So you get instead like one electron per uh, per manganese atom at the surface. So that would then give a higher capacity compared to carbon, where, which is uh, more related to the surface area. So you can simply have a higher coverage of the available surface. Uh, yeah, exactly. And you get and you get more electrons per surface area, since it more depends on how many manganese atoms you have at the surface than the, your than your total surface area. And uh, like uh, you, you also. Uh, re, um, Describe in the introduction the, the maxines and molybdenum sulfate, yeah. which are the layered materials. So, would you, uh, because this is a um, sort of question, is there so strict uh, boundary between surface redox act, uh, active materials and, and uh, insertion type materials? So, would you, for example, these this layered materials are they surface active or do they insert? And that's interesting, especially with these new new materials that have uh, really high capacity, such as them. Since they're 
I think their insertion in these layers, it's so it's so easy that it's inserted so easily. So then it kind of like you get uh, the same thing almost. So I would say that th there you don't cannot maybe really talk about surface versus insertion like you can do, for example, with with graphite or or titanium dioxide, which I think is more more uh, differentiated. So there the, with these and scenes and there the insertion is so is so fast. So there it's it's not so much of a difference between the two. Mm -hmm. That's at least my interpretation. I haven't worked a lot with, I've read a lot, of, some about them, since and molybdenum diosulfide, but that's my my explanation why they can reach such high capacity. Yeah. So have you thought about uh, also looking at, um, at, at uh, layered materials? Because you, you, know, you make a quite a good case in terms of selection of materials, why you do uh, titanium, manganese, uh, Vanadium. Uh, so one other material or type of materials could have been these layered ones, but I, I know it's, it, would, it would have been more more work. And it, would this be a um, sort of future project? Uh, also looking into this this electrolytes that you have chosen towards uh, such materials. Definitely, definitely, and a lot. I mean, the electrodes that I've used in this are based on on collaborations a lot. So, mm -hmm. uh, on uh, with the MCs, you need somebody who can who can do the the correct MCs for supercapacitors. But I really think that's uh, I've seen some pretty impo uh, impressive data, and I saw some publication quite recently where they started looking into combining MCs with with organic electrolytes. So that's. Um, because that's what they have been struggling with a lot. They use only aquas in a very narrow potential range. So if, if they could really start to use this type of organic electrolytes, then I think it could be uh, really promising. Mm. And in terms of, uh, so uh, then uh, later you described uh, the charge storage, or the, the uh, I think it's what you just think, uh, the you described that the, the double layer in, in ionic liquids is different from the from the classical one in, in aqueous or in, uh, in solute electrolytes. No? Uh, so in the uh, figure six on the right, so six D. So with this this crowding, you, you actually describe kind of uh, more more than one layer of, of counter ions. Yeah. Uh, does this Crowding actually allow for for higher capacitance. I mean, or, um, I know it's not a monolayer, but would this kind of allow for for higher capacitance than what you would get in a classical electrolyte with sort of? Uh, yeah, since since the capacitance is is somewhat proportional to the to the thick, inversely proportional to the thickness, you will get a higher capacitance if you have a thinner layer at the surface. Mm -hmm. So I'm not too sure that this would be would be beneficial, just uh, because of that. Um, but then there are a lot of other uh, promising aspects with ionic liquids. When you have these kind of like pores, and you have the pore sizes that approach the size of the ions, and you start to see some that you can actually reach a higher capacitance than what you could do with um, with an aqueous electrolyte. So I think there is a lot. To, to be worked with on ionic liquids with just double layer capacitance in carbon materials, but maybe not this type of outer, outer overcrowding. I'm not sure that that in itself would have a high, lead to a higher capacitance. Mm -hmm. And uh, because ion arrangement is of course important and uh, uh, for, for just for the, uh, the double layer capacitance. So what uh, type of, of methods are they around? I mean, what, what you haven't used, what, what what you could potentially use to, to, to get more uh, insights into this uh, ion arrangement uh, as a function of potential and, and charging speed and, and uh, uh, that's, a good, charge. that's a good question. Um, we have been maybe at some point we thought a little bit that you could use some kind of, um, and I know that they've done. But now I'm a little bit out of my depth, so to speak. But I think you can use some kind of uh, like neutron techniques, neutron reflectometry, and stuff like this mm -hmm. to really look at the surfaces. 
And of course, there are other techniques also, but you, NMR, for example, but you always like, if you want to do in situ measurements with supercapacitors, you really need something that's quite fast, not something, if you really want to investigate like how it really operates. And mm. that, it, I mean, it, 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 uh, it kind of like narrows down what type of, uh, um, what type of um, methods you can use. So it's a little bit tricky. One need to be uh, careful in, in choosing that. So uh, uh, some, maybe some other type of surface plasmas and, and stuff like that could, could maybe could uh, yeah. also be useful uh, to really see how the how the ions arrange at the surface. Now, one technique, actually, and this is why I ask it, it's, it's more comment. Uh, one of my postdocs has done quite a lot, and then he's a specialist in small angle scattering. And why this is useful for this is because it's uh, sensitive to to arrangements on the uh, on uh, length scales, which are from some sub nanometer to several nanometers, and this is exactly what what we have in, in double layers and in, in the nanopores. And so he could find out quite uh, nice things on, on this um, charge storage mechanism in. Uh, super capacitors and and one other thing and, and uh, he has just uh, recently pu published this is is on because there's a other one major other technique is since it's uh, ion uh, absorption it's, it's often used eqcm right. and what he actually found out is i mean and the eqcm is, is a tricky thing because typically the, as it's set up you have quite a, a large electrolyte reservoir. And what he found out is, is that uh, this, uh, by Sachs, he found it actually out, the ion arrangement and, and the exchange uh, between the, you know, the free electrolyte volume and, and the pores depends a lot on the, on the free electrolyte volume. And typically in the SCCM, you, you have a huge amount of free electrolyte volume, which was then, uh, which turned out that it's, what you sometimes measure per AQCM, you need to be careful to, to transfer it to a, a supercap where you have a thin separator. Because the, uh, especially when it comes then to, to, to equilibration and like in, in the self-discharge. And so in, in terms of uh, self-discharge, so, so what are the, why do supercaps self-discharge? And uh, how would, uh, this be different from hybrid supercups of the type you're using. Uh, my, I haven't really looked into the self-discharge nature of my materials, but I would, I mean, you you do have an interaction in when you have, for example, lithium, uh, the solid solution of of uh, lithium ions attached to them an O2 surface. So I, my my, I, if I would, um, my my feeling is that you would maybe get the slightly uh, lower self discharge compared to when it's only double layers at the surface, uh, but it would still be much faster than compared to to, tra to, to traditional batteries. Uh, but still, I wouldn't say that any supercapacitor would be excelling on the self discharge um, uh, times. I would say it mm. would still you would, you would still have a quite uh, fast self discharge. So have you done this uh, as a kind of as a standard method for all your uh, experiment or for all your setups? Like the, what, uh, what you often see in the SuperCup community is, is a leak current and self-discharge. Yeah, no, unfortunately not. We have, we have looked in, initially I looked at some uh, at some of these um, materials with ionic liquids, but then it was, I mean, we and maybe the self-discharge is more of a interesting if you would actually make a device to some extent and we're a little bit like for maybe for the highly concentrated it could be interesting but otherwise it's a little bit uh, we look more into the mechanism of the um, of the charge storage and uh, and if that when we've done that then maybe we can then look into the self-discharge but that was not the top of of my agenda at least when i when i started working here i was more uh, trying to understand the charge storage mechanism. Mm -hmm. and, but then ionic uh, liquids could be beneficial. I mean, it's it, they have a lower conductivity, so the self discharge should be slower compared to the aqueous electrolytes. So there, there are other like other benefits with ionic liquids that that I haven't really mentioned in this in this presentation. But that could be mm -hmm. one. 
And you, you touched a lot on, on potential windows, uh, because of course in capacity storage, it's, uh, the energy goes uh, square to it. And uh, so uh, how would you determine it? Because it's, I mean, you, you would uh, say, if you think of, of a CV, then, then you are at, the, at the start, you have some capacitive behavior and then it, it goes some sometimes up. No? Uh, but is the, just from the CV, there's no, no hard uh, criterion, really. So, so what are good possibilities to determine potential windows? Yeah, I think I think the what what the Rieb and uh, and co-workers showed with this uh, sodium TFSI highly concentrated electrolyte is quite interesting. Where they actually um, where they actually cycle it like a normal cyclic voltammogram and just expand the potential window, and then they calculate the um, uh, the Coulombic efficiency and take the derivative derivative of that, and they start to see when um, when it starts to like increase a lot. Uh, and then they say that at some point there you will actually reach uh, get a good estimate of your of your potential window or the limits uh, your stability limits of your electrolytes but that was for a, an activated carbon electrode where you don't have any type of interaction when we looked at the MNO2 it was a little bit uh, uh, with with VO2 it was a little bit trickier to to establish this but and i know that another coworker here at Chalmers he looked into the statistics on how the uh, on how the current starts to fluctuate when you start to increase the potential. And then he took, uh, but then that's also arbitrary. So it's a lot of these like arbitrary, like he selects a number and this, he, th he thinks that this number is good. And then he shows that it works mm -hmm. for this system. So it's a little bit tricky. It's the same like the traditional, you say you have um, three milliamp hours per, per square centimeter, but that's just the number. So it's a little bit tricky. And I guess it's, uh, you don't really know until you actually, in the worst case, you don't really know until you actually cycled it or, or like uh, really done a proper lifetime measurement to see if it actually holds. But I think there are more of these kind of derivat derivatives and more like deeper understanding that would uh, potentially save you a lot of time if you, if you did it correctly before you assemble your device. Yeah, that, I would think if you have a two electrode device, no? Uh, what you would, I mean, if, if you kind of determine your potential window in a three electrode device, you, you know how, how far you can go with one electrode in the, the positive and the other one in the negative direction. But if you make then just a two electrode device and, and let's say the one electrode decays quicker and then you just cycle by the total potential, uh, then actually the, the the, the potential of the electrode, which hasn't decayed as much, would go on a, on a, up, on a total um, potential scale up and up and up. No? So you'll never be sure that you're in with every individual electrode within yeah. the range. No? Yeah, so we haven't really developed so much full cells, but it's really like the, the, this. The, the, the measurements that I've experienced that I've done is only the beginning to really understand and get to optimize to get these maybe. 100,000 cycles that you want. It really is a fine tuning, and, and you don't want to be too conservative either because then you will lose uh, lose energy as well if you choose a too, too narrow potential window. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it takes a lot of uh, effort to really optimize it, I think. And uh, in terms of uh, potential windows, so there's also uh, the issue of, of carbon stability. Uh, you think this is uh, what would come earlier? Uh, carbon typically or electrolyte because carbon can also curl. And that's a tricky question. Um, I haven't looked into, I mean, the, the EMIM TIFS has a quite, uh, let's say, moderate stability window compared to the other, uh, to other ionic liquids. And I looked into some other, which has this type of like um, five volt stability window. And as far as I've seen it, they, always say that the electrodes, uh, electrolytes start to decompose. I haven't seen, at least in, in the papers that I've read, haven't really talked about carbon, uh, that the carbon also started to, to be affected. So, so I'm not sure. I think, I think the electrolyte would be, in most cases, the first to actually uh, uh, be affected. Mm. But they could be 
there could be some cases where you get the opposite, and uh, and it probably depends on the composition. Of yeah, the sure. electron. Yeah. And uh, in terms of the the oxides. Uh, because, if, for example, for the manganese oxide, uh, it could be also if, if you go too high, uh, to too high potential. Uh, could you think of, of like uh, oxygen evolution, which is uh, actually the, the issue when you have uh, battery overcharge? So, uh, would this be an issue, kind of, or, or how far away from oxygen evolution are you in your potential window that you used for, for this oxide? That's a good uh, question. Uh, I think that we, in both cases, were quite. I mean, when we and there we actually did some electrochemical stability window testing with the with ionic liquids, and I would say that we saw when we did this in a three electrode setup. Um, I'm pretty sure that we saw that the electrolyte decomposition happened uh, first. So we saw we we saw the increase in current, and then we disassembled the cell, and we saw discoloration of the separator, which I then attributed to that we started to uh, to break down our electrolyte. But of course, and also you could have you, we have a little bit of water in our ionic liquids, so that could mm -hmm. also make things a little bit worse. Um, but I'm more nervous or more concerned that when you go to two negative potential, I think that's the, where you really have the negative impact, where you can actually start to dissolve MnO2 or or create this type of uh, um, states that are less um, uh, less electrochemically active than the MnO2 material. Mm. And uh, because uh, it's a good uh, transfer to the next topic, you say uh, like trace water. And uh, it, that there is, uh, you, you made very interesting work with the MnO2, where you show that, uh, that you need protons. And so, could you actually uh, think of, of simply trace water activating this proton? Uh, I mean, the, the, you need protons for, for, for having the MnO2, the, the extra storage with the MnO2. And you made quite uh, Nice studies with different protic and aprotic ionic liquids and with different uh, proton activity, but would simply trace water be a good way forward? Yeah, we, we, have, we have considered this, and uh, but what would speak against that would be that we had the highest water content in the in the Brunstedt acid, the ETOHIM, the TFSI electrolytes. That one mm -hmm. had the highest water content and had the lowest capacity so then maybe that then that does then the water in itself that doesn't seem to be affected by um, affect the mno2 charge storage and with the and with the with the protic ionic liquid i mean it's, it's a it's a protic ionic liquid that has a quite low pk value but still if you would compare this pk value to more traditional um, uh, acids, it is a very weak acid. So it's not, I mean, it's, we, we don't have any deprotonation to have to any extent. So I don't really see how the water would, uh, would in that case then activate the MnO2 if we wouldn't mm -hmm. see it in the, in the, in the Brunstedt acid, because there I would also then expect to see uh, an impact of the water content, which yeah. we don't see. Okay. And uh, so, uh, how, how much is known about how the proton is involved in this uh, charge storage? The, there are some some studies that has been done before, and and um, um, and what they've seen is that, or in the paper that I've, I've uh, read, maybe most is that they've seen that by changing the acid, by adding more acid in the in the ionic liquid synthesis. By changing the equilibrium, they get the higher uh, capacity from, I think, ruthenium oxide in that case, uh, which is like similar to MnO2. Uh, so in that case, it seemed to actually affect it. Um, but they haven't really done any of this uh, systematic approach where they investigate the different uh, ionic liquids and the, and the proton activity. Mm -hmm. So there are some there are some indications that it plays an important role, but not exactly exactly how it's not it's not that clear. Mm 
Yeah. And there are also like some, and there are also some other studies where they actually shown that the, that you can get some kind of contribution even with the aprotic ionic liquid, which is completely contrary to what we found, yeah. which is interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a little bit like the contrary results, one can say. Mm -hmm. uh, from the quite interesting. And you also added at the same time lithium. Yeah. Um, yeah, both with the aprotic and the protic ionic liquid. Yeah. So, uh, is, is this indeed that understood what the lithium is doing? If you have both the, the, the lithium and the protons. Uh, lithium in the in the protic ionic liquid. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No. Then I mean that was an attempt maybe to even, to get contributions both from the lithium and the cation, which didn't really it it didn't really affect the um, affect the charge storage at all. Which maybe now in retrospect when I work with this it it maybe it makes more sense because we have so much more. Uh, protic cations in our electrolytes, so that adding a little, a little bit more lithium uh, doesn't really change anything. It will be stuck in the in the in the surface layers at the at the interface. Mm -hmm. so, you, you said about, uh, I think it was from your theoretical results that the, that the proton is is more mobile in the in the surface layer than the lithium. If I yeah. understand. Yes. Uh, that could be one hypothesis, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. When we compare the aprotic and the protic ionic liquid with lithium, then uh, definitely, then the lithium needs to diffuse through these e layers of enium cations uh, to reach the surface where it forms this solid solution. And then it stacks, and then there is like a gradual accumulation of lithium. Uh, um, while in the protic ionic liquid, you have already a layer with, with, uh, with interaction acting cations, so you don't really need this type of diffusion mm -hmm. where it happens much faster, at least. Yeah, and so uh, because it's, it's a sort of parallel to, to oxygen electrochemistry, which I'm working a lot, and there, uh, there's some major factor is the Lewis acidity of the cations. And so I was wondering, could it be simply the, uh, the Lewis acidity of the cation, which impacts the, the mechanism. So like between the midosoliums, like the ether midosolium and the, and the, so the EMI and the EMIM, could this be the, the different Lewis acidity, which makes an impact on the, on the different results? Yeah, then the, I guess the, the Lewis acidity would be affected by the proton activity or what you would, what you would yeah. call it. Yeah, so I think I, I think that's the what we see with with the inductive side. All the protons are attached to to carbons, and and when we when we try to do some kind of when we did this um, Cosmo RS measurements or calculations on the PKA on the PKA value, mm. we still got the but a very very high PKA value. So any type of proton activity is very low. So I guess if that's related to the Lewis acidity, then then yes, it would play a, an important role. Mm -hmm. and then uh, coming to the TiO2, uh, so I think it's, it's sometimes described as, as a, a surface redox active material, but also it can uh, insert. So, yes. is there, uh, so in, when does it? When is it surface active, and, and uh, when uh, when is it in insertion type storage? Uh, I guess. Yes, it, yeah, that's a good question, um, and I think that my uh, co-worker uh, on, on in paper five he thought a lot about this and the, and the redox activity and the, and different centers and redox active centers and stuff like that. But I guess that you could then calculate and see how much how much capacity you you actually. I mean, it depends on the scan speed. So if you use um, yeah, so I think that at least in in, in in the study that we have, we we only lithiate like the outer the outer surface layers. We don't have any real bulk intercalation. So then you are maybe in the boundary then. But I I still think that we have some some insertion. It's not only surface uh, uh, surface reactions. Um, 
at, at 10 millivolts per second, for example, then I, then I think we have some kind of insertion. But, mm. uh, but, but, very, but very thin layers at the surface, I would say. Yeah. And, and it probably, yeah, probably depends on the, on the electrode morphology as well. I mean, we, we don't have that much surface area in, in our material. It has a quite low surface area. So then I would say that, it, uh, that you, may, you get more contribution from, from insertion. Mm. And you know about the, the, the off-stoichiometric titanium oxides, uh, like uh, one type, uh, it's, you can have it black, uh, so, that, so then it's much more conductive, or it, it goes all the way to the uh, so-called Magnelli phases. Uh, just a question, I don't know, it, it, do you know about whether they have been investigated for, for, uh, for, for uh, capacitance? Because they're actually metallic, uh, some of them. I, th I think the um, I think the oxygen deficient the black TiO two they, they they tried it for supercapacitors, mm -hmm. and I looked into and I was quite intrigued in the middle of my thesis I was intrigued with these type of uh, uh, modifications where you could actually increase the conductivity of your electrode. But uh, it uh, yeah it's always like we needed to find somebody with the experience to to actually um, uh, to actually make this kind of material and it ended up being uh, somebody with uh, with vo2 instead which also has a quite quite high conductivity but mm -hmm. uh, but i think that's a, an interesting approach if it but yeah at least on a, on a scientific uh, level it's it's interesting to see how because the the um, the conductivity of your electrode really affects your um, uh, your high power performance, the, the the resistance of your cell. So I think that would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of uh, electrolytes and the, and the highly concentrated ones, uh, I think it, it's in the introduction, you say that um, as the, the concentration increases, uh, then there's more and more of the water coordinated, and then it's preferentially the anion which is reduced. Uh, then at the negative side, and uh, if it's just a, a comment, we, we, uh, there should be any time a paper coming uh, out uh, where I collaborated with uh, three people from Montpellier, and I did uh, in situ aspect. What we actually showed uh, that the anion is actually not reduced; it's it's, it's the water. <laughs> Because still the anion, because there was some uh, some thought that the anion would be really reduced at 1.5 volts versus lithium, which is uh, in terms of uh, just for the case of TFSI, which is quite high. And so what we found is actually that it's not the anion which is reduced, but it's um, the, the reduction products of the water which decompose the anion. And so. Uh, but this paper should come out anytime soon. And in terms of the, the high concentration, uh, highly concentrated electrolytes, there's also one class. I uh, was wondering whether you know if, if they have been investigated for supercapacitance. Uh, this is high concentrations of, of lithium TFSI climbs, uh, which uh, then they call coordination ionic liquids. Have they been used or do you think they are any useful? I, I haven't seen any when I read up on this. I, the only non-aqueous highly concentrated electrolyte was based on acetonitrile. So I haven't seen anything with glines, but I know that we worked a lot on in, in other fields, for example, uh, lithium sulfur batteries. So they, we worked, they worked a lot on glines and with these. So I think maybe that could be an interesting way because acetonitrile doesn't seem to work. So if you want to, if you want to have a highly concentrated non-aqueous electrolyte, maybe, maybe that could be interesting. But it depends on the conductivity and the viscosity. So, and mm -hmm. I'm, not too, I'm not too familiar with glines, so I'm, I would be, it's, it's tricky to, to answer. Yeah. Me. And you, you had the, the eight molar uh, highly concentrated. So this this was a trade off between stability and conductivity. Yes. So and, uh, um, did you then uh, tune through the different concentrations to, to, to see which one you choose? Or? Uh, we, 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 we took a little bit of a faster track. We tried the 21 molal and found that that was way too viscous. And then, and then we found this paper 
uh, where they did all this work and fine tuning and choosing the right electrolyte. So I felt like it was a little, and it made sense. So I thought that, ah, let's, okay, so let's try what they recommend. And that seemed to work out fine. But, but of course, it's good to, to reevaluate results and to repeat results. So maybe there could be some, some uh, fine tuning there. But I think, I think your optimum will be around there where you can find the highest conductivity. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, then I, okay, well, I can come to the methods. Uh, it's, uh, I'm only on the, on the, on the border in researching on supercups, but so whenever we, we had a paper on supercups under review, uh, then we, we determine cyclability and then capacitance uh, by, uh, you can do it by either carbonostatic or by CV. And then the, whatever we, you do, when, uh, there's always one reviewer who says, it's just the other method which should be used. Uh, you can do what you want. It's always one who says it's the other. So what, what do you use and, and how do you argue for the one or the other? Yeah, uh, we had this discussion quite, quite recently uh, in our group. And, and I would say that I use cyclic voltammetry when it's like when it's a very new material when we really want to to be able to compare it to other to other results uh, because then you know you know what the 10 millivolt per second uh, scan speed means how how far how long it will take and, and it's easier to compare to other materials but but it's not it's not how you're actually going to charge your your cell if you actually make a device so then mm -hmm. if you look more into like how it behaves under proper cycling you would probably need some type of uh, galvanostatic cycling but uh, but i would say that at least uh, yeah for the first measurement of a completely new material i would go for cyclic voltammetry and then if it goes to be working fine then all right then you can try your galvanostatic cycling and really see how it behaves and and plot your energy and power and whatever but but first uh, cyclic voltammetry mm. so but uh, uh, i don't know it but you, you educate me so there is no standard that you, which is agreed on it's because uh, this is what I noticed that whatever you do, it's always, always one says it's the other thing. What you should do. Not, not to my knowledge. Mm, okay. And then, in terms of, uh, you, you say one problem is, is reference electrodes. Uh, then you resorted, I think, to, to, to silver uh, sheet or wire. Yeah. And uh, I, I've seen another. Uh, Thing. It's, it's uh, people from PSI that they use simply activated carbon and as a pseudo reference. So, have you, I mean, uh, I, I guess it's, it's, it's still acceptably stable, uh, what, what yeah. you see. Well, yeah. yeah, no, that I haven't seen uh, actually, uh, but, but yeah, as long as it's stable, but then I would guess you would have no. With the silver, you will have some kind of like silver, silver plus that you will have uh, silver plus going into the solution. But I would guess then with the carbon, you would be uh, not have any counter ion in your electrolytes. So I would have mm -hmm. to on how that exactly works. But uh, but no, normally I mean you would use some kind of inert uh, metal um, as your as your reference, or or maybe a lithiated uh, uh, some kind of lithiated structure. As your as your reference, yeah. Whenever you have lithium ions in the electrolyte and a, a slightly delithiated LFP, is, is yeah, exactly. This is what uh, I always use. And, uh, but of course, you need to get the ion in the electrolyte uh, to make sense. And, or in, in the case of sodium, uh, you can um, use the vanadate. Right. And. Uh, in terms of uh, measuring lifetime, you, you said there, that there was some accelerated lifetime testing. Um, you, you mentioned one paper, I think they simply hold it at a, yeah. as a, a leak current test. And, and then every so often, then they do cycling. Uh, but it's not uh, something that you have done, actually. No, no, it, it's something that I. I've heard there's a lot of discussion in the community and, and a lot of people start to recommend that they, you should do it like this instead of just uh, cycling it uh, 
because you can if you cycle it too fast you can cycle get quite impressive cycle lifetime but mm. uh, not be operated like that in in reality so that would be something that i would take into consideration if i would um, when moving into a material that i really believe in then i would, would uh, then i would probably suggest this type of uh, potential hold mm. Um, I think this was, I had one other question about the, the proteganic liquid, because in, in your figure 26, you, you have shown it's actually your, your proteganic liquid cation is kind of flat on the surface. But in the presentation, you have shown it's, uh, and, and you described the, the, the upright, the standing uh, orientation, and actually in the presentation you have shown it. Uh, yeah, I, I chose this because it's it's more clearer that we, we have the we have done the calculation where it's standing up as well, and we see the same trend. We see a stronger interaction energy with the protic ionic liquid compared to the other ones, but there is no clear bend in that particular figure. So I chose this to illustrate the interaction, the difference between the two uh, cations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then, yeah, and then the standing geometry. I mean, it's interesting because it's that's not how it's reported for 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 aprotic ionic liquids with with carbon materials for example they they suggest uh, more of this parallel uh, configuration is that so but uh, in principle this parallel configuration has some sort of energy minimum also so it's not complete. Yeah, probably because it's because the um, uh, the the layer becomes thinner in this case so that's mm -hmm. why uh, this is favorable i would say yeah and uh, the, regarding the materials morphology, uh, it's uh, here's the figure 32, where you had the, the uh, epsilon MnO2 and the carbon nanofiber. Yeah. So uh, I understand this, this is a more the, uh, a mechanistic investigation in terms of what, um, yeah. This is, of, of how the, the manganese layer should look like uh, rather than a, wood, rather than a practical electrode, because this is what we, uh, we mentioned in the, in the beginning, uh, that the electrode as a whole is quite fluffy, so you need a lot of electrolyte actually to fill it. Yeah. It's probably, I mean, it's, um, you can, you see other people when they do this kind of CNF and they can get very nice and thin layers at the surface of your, uh, of the carbon nanofibers with your active material and you can reach, maybe reach the theoretical capacitance, uh, but it's too low to be of any practical use. So if you would load it up with the double, you would get the higher capacitance, even, even if your theoretical, uh, even if your specific capacitance of your active material goes down. So it's yeah. So that's why I'm trying to 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 tell in that that you really need to have um, uh, really need to have uh, to, to take into consideration consideration both the conductivity and the amount of active material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because in terms of performance, it's, it, it's quite quite good. But uh, I, uh, so yeah, this was a question. So in, in the figure set is three. Uh, it's, it's here at the left. Um, you say it's relative volumetric charge. So this is volumetric regarding which volume? The volumetric. electrode? Relative voltametric charge. Ah, word, sorry. <laughs> I misread it. Okay, okay. Yeah, I misread it as, as volumetric, sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So volume, we haven't really talked so much about, or I haven't thought of too much about volume and density actually in, in any of these, mm. in any of these materials. Uh, but it's of course something that needs to be, yeah, to measure the density. I mean, I don't, I'm not 100% sure what the density would be of, of these materials more than that. The density of the CNF composite is much lower than the alpha MnO2 electrode. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, in, uh, the, as you have it brought up, this figure on the right. So, would this this would go somehow in the direction of what we said before about the, the different TI2 phases, like the black one? So, the, the goal was to really in, increase conductivity of those. 
Yes. Yeah. And then you you came up with so and actually you have seen it's it's uh, has uh, it, it develops a different uh, redox chemistry over time actually. Yeah. So it's kind of as a as a overall uh, question. Uh, so because I I think that the, you pointed out your research questions quite quite nicely and it, it's very round work and, and uh, well conceived so what, what would you consider as the as your, your most important exciting result and what you're most proud of and what discovery i mean science is often about discovery uh, that's all that's that's uh, tricky but but i would actually say that it it has to it has it has to have to do with the protic ionic liquid that's that's what i've been working uh, most on during these uh, during these five years so i it's yeah maybe maybe to to really compare these different uh, ionic liquids and see the differences uh, and really try to understand because I mean normally MnO2 when you use it in in non-aqueous electrolytes you get the lower capacity so maybe maybe by choosing a, it doesn't have to be an ionic liquid maybe there is a, a suitable organic solvent out there that could actually give the same level of of uh, capacity on your MnO2 material but then have a the, an, um, a stability window that's around three volt then. Then that would be uh, really beneficial. So maybe this is, yeah, it's at least, uh, yeah, I would say that uh, maybe that's what I'm most happy that it worked out. Mm -hmm. Actually, there's, uh, it was maybe three weeks ago, there was a very nice paper in, in Nature Materials from Yi Chung Lu, she's in, in Hong Kong. Uh, she, she made a, a new sort of, of these highly concentrated electrolytes. And uh, Actually, with three components, so the salt and the, the, the water, but she added uh, PEOs in it. Uh, and so, to, to reduce the amount of, uh, so, so to still have uh, uh, highly coordinated water, but uh, to reduce the amount of, of water and salt uh, that it's needed. So, this may be a, uh, something to, to think of in this uh, context. Yeah. So, and then you think uh, in, in terms of uh, if, if you would, would think of a follow-up PhD student, uh, what would be the most uh, promising direction that grew out of your work? So this would be this. Maybe. I would, then I would, because it's something that I tried to to actually um, to do more experiments on these, uh, on, uh, I, uh, on, on, um, uh, supercapacitors at, at elevated temperatures, which I think is quite nice, and it, it really like uh, uses another aspect of ionic liquids that that's really useful compared to compared to organic electrolytes or water based electrolytes. So I would say maybe try to do some kind of high temperature uh, hybrid supercapacitor because I don't mm -hmm. think it's too well studied, and then try to understand like the mechanism and. And I, I talked a little bit about VO2 and the low transition temperature, which has been shown in, I think in one paper, one uh, scientist showed that he could manage to get a higher uh, capacitance of VO2 when he slightly increased the temperature in an aqueous electrolyte. So, so it's, it seems to work, but I think you need to be a good chemist and really make sure that you have your monoclinic, monoclinic uh, phase uh, and, and that it's stable. So I, I would say that some kind of, Elevate the temperature, or or even at at colder temperature as well, has also increased in in research interest as well. So I would mm -hmm. maybe move away a little bit from the room temperature to to further emphasize the the benefits of ionic liquids. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, that's all I wanted to ask. Uh, well, ask it was more uh, discussion. <laughs> And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will then continue with the uh, with the committee members. And uh, so, should we start first with uh, Dr. Cronier? Are you with us? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, uh, I would like to uh, 
thank and uh, acknowledge uh, Simon for uh, his work and also, of course, uh, uh, his uh, supervisors. Um, so uh, I must uh, admit that uh, it's uh, quite an impressive work because you uh, studied many different materials using uh, different uh, electrolytes, either aqueous or organic electrolytes, ionic liquids. Um, and in fact, I had a few questions, but uh, most of them uh, were already answered during the discussion that you had previously. Um, and in fact, I had uh, two uh, remarks, and I think that, uh, well, you pointed out the, these, um, these uh, key points uh, to my sense. Um, to fully understand what's going on with the materials. Um, I think that uh, it's really important to have, uh, uh, let's say, uh, either uh, uh, in situ or even operando measurements. And of course, you need to have very uh, accurate um, devices because the uh, reactions are so fast in supercapacitors or in electrochemical capacitors. So I think it's uh, such experiments are really mandatory to fully understand what's going on at the surface. But you already uh, discussed about that. And I think also that an important point is, um, is the density of the materials because uh, for practical applications, um, the density and volumetric um, uh, capacities are, are important, is a really important point. Um, I have a, a question regarding the, the results that you gave in uh, either in your uh, thesis or during your presentation, because you often compare the, the, the capacitance or the capacity values of the different materials that you use. And regarding uh, either uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the power capability or the cycling stability uh, when you use different electrolytes. But then you give the results usually in, um, in relative values. And I was just wondering if you can reach uh, similar uh, values, like similar capacities uh, with the different electrolytes. Uh, you mean maybe on figure 30? Um, like on figure uh, 31 or 33. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, see, it, it, you kind of lose a little bit with of the information of the actual capacity that you have. For example, with in figure 31, it doesn't really show that the, the titanium dioxide in LP30 has a much higher capacity than all of these other materials, for example. Yes. Um, so I would be, and this is a little bit like comparing apples with pears with oranges. So I just wanted to, to show uh, how they b behaved in a similar context. And also that these are maybe the, yeah. So, uh, so I would say maybe from, yeah, maybe in the, on this, yeah, it's, 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 it's tricky. So, um, I mean, what? I was just uh, wondering if you can reach the same values or not, or similar values. With another, with another electrolyte? Yes, or, or when you compare some different, uh, different electrolytes, like uh, in one of the papers you, uh, with the KOH and the ionic liquids, yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's quite uh, similar, like the relative, well, you, you you clearly see that uh, uh, you have different behaviors, but uh, can you reach uh, capacities as high as you can uh, get with uh, uh, aqueous electrolytes? Right? At room temperature, I'm not yes. sure. I, I'm not sure at room temperature. It's a little mm -hmm. bit. You would probably need some kind of uh, highly concentrated electrolytes, maybe with some kind of different salt to really get. Uh, and still, I mean, the, 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 the KOH, for example, that I, that I compared it with, and also the high the sulfuric acid, those are like kind of like extreme electrolytes to some extent. So I think it would be more, maybe more honest to actually compare it to a neutral electrolyte 
uh, with the salt, a normal like uh, lithium sulfate or, or whatever. And there, I think you could probably reach a, a, a similar a similar uh, performance. But um, um, but with ionic liquids, are uh, a little bit skeptical. Uh, and there, I think the benefit lies in other areas. Uh, um, that's at least my opinion. But I've seen, but still, I, I, you can if you look uh, if you look on publications, there are people who've managed to get get very good energy and power using uh, using ionic liquid electrolytes. So maybe. Maybe if you can choose, maybe there are more um, uh, better, more suitable ionic liquids out there where you could actually get the high uh, performance. So you can, if you can tweak it, otherwise make it into a gel or something to increase the uh, the conductivity. But um, uh, but yeah, it requires, uh, um, yeah, it's uh, it's um, I guess it's uh, it requires a good screening process and, and really figure out. Um, because I mean, yeah, it's really the conductivity of the of the interface that really matters. Not maybe not so much the the, the conductivity of the bulk. So you would really need to to know the interface and and maybe choose uh, some kind of uh, yeah some kind of diluent or something which could uh, uh, make it a little bit faster. But uh, but it's tricky for the ionic liquid it, because it really starts behind with the, when it comes to the conductivity and, and viscosity compared to to um, to aqueous electrolytes. Okay, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, answer. Um, and so I don't know how much time I have. I don't want to uh, uh, speak for too long because I know that other people uh, in the committee are have probably questions. So maybe that I should stop now. Uh, Feel free to pull and pose another question if you'd like. Um, we're not so personal. Okay. Um, so I had an, another question uh, regarding. Well, I think that's uh, in the yes, um, in the uh, figure thirty-five about the cycling stability. Um, so uh, regarding the different electrolytes, uh, so it can be clearly seen that you have a, a good fade during the first cycles with the the usual LT thirty uh, yeah. compared to. Uh, the TFSI, and um, so how well? How can you explain that this well? You, you mentioned that uh, it's some kind of blocking uh, the the surface, uh, but do you have any uh, clues of that, like proofs uh, to to explain and uh, how th this behavior is so uh, different uh, using the different electrolytes? Yeah, why the different? Why the behavior is different is that's a little bit uh, uh, tricky to. We're, we're actually doing some XPS measurements uh, yes. next week to really investigate this further. But I mean, with TiO two inorganic electrolytes, they they you normally see this type of behavior, and I think it's the because of the irreversible formation of some like uh, lithium titanate or uh, uh, yeah some kind of these lithiated phases at the surface where the lithium insertion then becomes much slower that's at least my understanding and that's a big big drawback of the titanium dioxide material so why this doesn't happen in the ionic liquid maybe it could be that actually less, less lithium is actually inserted i mean we have uh, you have a slower lithium diffusion so maybe you maybe you form another some kind of other phase, but like with these shifts in the CVs, maybe you form something that that doesn't block the lithium as um, as efficiently as when you have the organic electrolytes. And then that would also yeah, yeah. be like to that it would be interesting to actually cycle one electrode first in the ionic liquid electrolyte, and then maybe take it out and try it in the organic electrolyte and see. If this can be retained, or if or if everything is just reversed once you insert lithium ions properly. Yes, that's a very good point and very good idea to do to do too. So, uh, yes, but in fact, um, since you probably have less lithium insertion, uh, it's true. So that means that you will get a lower uh, capacity uh, compared to uh, to the one with the ionic liquid. So. In fact, it's almost the same remark. Like uh, you show the uh, capacity retention, but in, uh, in relative values. But if you reach a lower uh, capacity absolute values, 
uh, with uh, with the ionic liquid, then maybe that can explain why it's more stable. Let's say. Yeah, I definitely think that's that's could be the key reason. Okay. Anyway, uh, okay. Thank you very much, and uh, so I let uh, the other uh, members of the committee. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we give the, the word to uh, Anna Anderson. Are you with us? Yes. Yes. Oh, Hello. Please. Can you hear me? Yes. Very well. Very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you very much for uh, uh, an interesting uh, uh, morning with uh, good presentations and a good discussion between uh, you, Simon, and Stefan. Um, uh, I, I appreciated that a lot. Um, I um, uh, thought uh, I had read your, your thesis, and I think it's a uh, uh, really, really beautifully presented thesis with a nice uh, writing, and it's an interesting topic uh, and industrially uh, applicable. Um, my, uh, my profession is I'm a senior scientist at uh, ABB. Uh, corporate research and uh, at ABB we are using supercapacitors in in different uh, applications. You mentioned the TUSA uh, flash charging, um, uh, basically a peak shaving uh, solution for charging buses and uh, and but we are also using them in bridging UPS uh, systems. Um, in data centers, etc., and and also uh, uh, we have a product called Enviline, which is an energy recuperation system for train station, uh, sort of uh, saving, uh, breaking energy from trains and and utilizing them when trains are accelerated out from the stations. So there are many many um, industrially uh, industrial applications uh, for supercapacitors and. Uh, and uh, but of course they are as uh, with uh, batteries and, and other uh, storage uh, technologies they they are also faced with uh, with um, some issues and problems I think some uh, you have addressed in in the discussions uh, you had but um, I had a few questions I think uh, some of them have have uh, already been addressed but uh, I can sort of touch upon them anyway if you don't mind. I think the first one um, you you presented specific uh, capacity. You have presented specific capacitances for all these uh, material systems, and um, my my original question was uh, was related to how these uh, figures um, compare to a real. Uh, energy in a real cell or device and you you touched you you uh, mentioned that in in uh, your presentation uh, nevertheless i think for in in this uh, figure 3 that you presented uh, and that you discussed with uh, stefan i'm not sure i think your your image has freezed Simon. so i hope you can hear me at least i can hear you Yes, very good. <laughs> no, figure two, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think that, that what you have presented here are, are, um, are modules, uh, the energy density on module yeah. level. Yeah. Which sort of no, I think the commercial... further. Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, at least the commercial, the commercial uh, ones are modules, but then I haven't really thought about this much then when I actually started writing this thesis. So, mm, so mm. It's, I think it's, at least when I looked at the homepages, uh, when, and when you hear about batteries, it's more of a talk, be, modules versus cells, uh, or pack battery packs versus battery cells. And here I'm not, I never, I, I didn't, at least I didn't find any data on um, on a cell level or what you would call yeah. it. I think there, there are, are data available. So I think to be to compare the lithium ion data, which is the cell based data, um, you should have put in some uh, cell cell data and, and they actually end up uh, somewhere around seven or eight uh, watt hours per kilogram. So they are maybe a little bit higher than the, the two to three uh, watt hours that yeah. you mentioned. So uh, sort of a rule of thumb is that if you have a specific energy uh, for a material, 
if you divide that with the three or four a factor of three or four, you end up sort of in the right region for the for the cell. Um, so that was uh, just a, a sort of comment, and maybe one should have uh, included the cell data in this um, uh, figure too. Um, and then I also have, since I'm I'm from the industry now, I I won't go so much into detail. Um, this is my maybe a, a sort of a tough question <laughs> to answer, but how much now you're um, you have been working on the ionic liquids, uh, um, which uh, uh, aims to extend the voltage range of the supercapacitors, which is really good. But but in reality, how much of the voltage range do you think is usable in a practical commercial supercapacitor system? Oh, that's a good uh, good question. I look when you see, I mean, oh, that's a good question. Um, I would say that it's probably much, I mean, some of the data that I've seen uh, where they use well-known organic electrolytes, they use a quite conservative uh, voltage range compared to what they, what they might manage in theory or in, or in the lab. So I would say that it's, uh, yeah, I, I don't know, three point, uh, I guess that the resulting potential window will be, will be smaller than the, than the theory, because if you push it to the limit, you will then pay with a reduced cycle lifetime. So you really want to be sure that you can have your 1 million cycles. So I would say maybe you, is it, yeah. I don't know if you cut away maybe the, the, the maybe twenty percent of the of the upper upper limit of your potential maybe yeah. to be able to get your uh, to get to be able to get that you have your ten years of of, uh, of lifetime of your device maybe mm. Mm. I think I think the upper limit is one one issue but but for a real system um, just uh, for for your information you you can't really. Uh, discharge to uh, to very low values because then since uh, since the device is usually you you ex extract some uh, constant power uh, which is uh, voltage times current so if you decrease the voltage towards zero you you actually have to increase the current and then you have to design your whole system for very lar large current so in practice you can actually maybe only use 50% uh, of the voltage range. Um, and this might be for, uh, for normal capacitors, capacitor like with using carbon with these sloping um, uh, discharge uh, um, uh, curve, voltage curve. But uh, I think maybe with these, um, these um, Faradaic materials uh, with, with a more, um, a flattening of the curve. Maybe you can utilize more. Actually, I, I didn't think of of it before uh, reading your thesis, but maybe this is the case. And maybe and some of them also have. Uh, if you don't use a symmetric cell, you can you can run it at the higher potential. You don't actually run it down to zero volts, so you end up at two volts or something. If you use a lithium ion capacitor type. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, I think that's a big benefit, uh, actually. Um, very good. Um, so, I, I mean, my point is just that you you uh, end up with a system. You 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 uh, you have a good material, but when then when you put it into a device, a cell first, and then into a system, you start reducing more and more of that uh, energy capacity. Or energy density. Uh, so, uh, so uh, it's um, uh, these systems be quite becomes quite costly, and this is one of the main uh, uh, issues we have uh, when putting it into commercial systems. That uh, that uh, the supercapacitors are very costly compared to batteries. Uh, um, battery technologies. Another um, problem that we face with, with these standard um, supercapacitors is the, uh, 
uh, lifetime actually because even though you you say it's like you say at room temperature and, and under uh, very good conditions you can uh, you can uh, cycle these uh, these uh, units for for millions of cycles but 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 actually the aging and and especially aging at elevated temperature as we have uh, uh, experienced um, it becomes quite um, uh, an effect also in these systems. Uh, um, it's very well known for lithium ion batteries, but for supercapacitors, uh, this is much less studied. So uh, I think you touched upon it in your last comment from uh, Stefan's question uh, regarding what, uh, what is the, the sort of um, um, uh, promising direction ahead, but but I think uh, just wanted uh, wanted um, your comments maybe on the temperature um, stability or the thermal um, properties also also in in cycling and aging uh, in the cycling and aging perspective of these ionic liquid uh, systems or the systems that you have studied. I think yeah. you have comment a little bit, but maybe ionic liquids. I mean, it's not like organic solvents. So you have, I guess you would have a different degradation mechanism compared mm. to maybe maybe um, evaporation and and, and mm. such we have for the organic. So maybe that would be more to be sure that you have a good because a lot of ionic ionic liquids can be quite good uh, um, uh, solvents so maybe you need to maybe it's more of an issue to choose a good binder for your electrode in that case so you don't mm. you don't dissolve it over time and that you actually have a pure ionic liquid which you could also be if you have impurities i guess that could also be could also be negative if you increase the temperature you could get uh, different side reactions and stuff like and 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 uh, similar uh, problems but for the ionic liquid if you have a good system then i guess it would maybe we, I, at least compared to the organic uh, electrolytes you would see maybe less uh, degradation issues if you mm -hmm. choose it right but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think more more uh, is and and also like yeah, with I with the supercapacitors uh, that's another advan advantage over lithium ion batteries that uh, with the lithium ion batteries it's it's quite tricky to have this type of like eighty to one hundred what what you normally have like in the in the um, engine department of uh, of um, of a truck for example then you would uh, mm. then maybe supercapacitors could um, not only compete in energy density but also in in stability but. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, yeah, more, more studies, but I, I, I've seen some, so there are people looking at this, but more, maybe more on the hybrid side, which is lacking mm -hmm. a little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I think that's a good idea. Um, I don't think I have so much else. Um, uh, I just had a... Uh, question, I think you had written some uh, for molar concentration, I think you had used some small m. Yes. Is Mol that a... moles per kilogram of solvent? Ah, okay, okay. I, I figure. So it was a little bit mixed. So sometimes large m, sometimes. Our, our co workers used uh, molars in their work. So that was a nice experience with the exchange that uh, you need to, uh, yeah, kind of like unify different techniques in the labs. So when I came there, they smaller so then i use no else so then it it became a little bit of a mixed bag but hopefully in the paper it comes through at least what the difference is right right okay maybe i missed that okay uh thank you very much from my side i think i leave leave the, the word to someone else thank you very much and we continue with Jörn Littmann, who is in the room so please Thank you very much. And thank you, Simon, for a, a very nice thesis. I enjoyed reading it a lot. Uh, I learned a lot. And thanks also for the discussion and presentation today. V very nice. Uh, of course, most of my questions have also been addressed, uh, but I have a few. I thought we'd spend a little bit more time on uh, the double layer issue. Perhaps you can take that picture. To yes. Five and yes. <laughs> The thesis back up uh, again. Uh, and just as you mentioned, for the aqueous systems, we have uh, 
pretty good models for how to describe the double layer, but these don't really work for, for the ionic liquids. What do you say are the most important reasons why it doesn't work for ionic liquids? Because you, I, I guess it's the main issue would be that you don't have any any solvents because in this it's not so clear in this this th there are more advanced models than the one that I have here where they show the solvated ions and that you don't have at all in these ionic liquids you don't have any solvation so you get um, I, I had to read up a little bit when I wrote the thesis that you get this uh, like uh, like almost friction between the ions so I guess that would be the main that the existing of these frictions would would be the main difference between these two and why you can get this strange overcrowding, for example. I agree completely. Do you also think size is an issue? Uh, it could be sterical hindrance. Yes, when the ions become big, uh, I think that, that also plays an important uh, role because, uh, yeah, definitely. Very nice. Uh, another electrochemical uh, question. If you go on to figure 16, for example, just as an example here. Um, you should see. Exactly. Like here. So, um, <clears throat> if I understand this correctly, for the this CV to the, the right there, the titanium dioxide, this is measured in an ionic liquid. Yes. And uh, normally when we do CVs in, in aqueous, it's quite easy to, to address the peaks. They're usually related to interactions with water in one way or the, the other. Yeah. How do you go about when you work when you do CVs in a novel, non-aqueous electro? How easy is it to to assign peaks? Do you know what is oxidizing and what's reducing here? Yeah, in, in the titanium dioxide case, because it's such a well-studied material, yeah. then I would say that this was you could find some, and and because the ion the electrolyte in this case is is quite similar to that of a normal with the with the solvent and the salt because the the ionic liquid in itself doesn't interact with the, uh, with the material. So then it's quite, it was not so tricky and compared with LP30, we saw that this is lithium insertion and this is extraction. So that was quite straightforward. And then, then you can read up that there is this solid solution that is created here. But it was more tricky maybe with the vanadium dioxide. That was uh, a little bit or a big challenge uh, to really, because it's such a, it's not really a well-studied material in the case in the, in, in with the with the mechanism because it's uh, people who have studied on it they use it because it it has a high capacity and then they don't care so much about the mechanism in itself. So then you a little bit um, uh, in the dark there. So you really need to to do a lot of experiments yourself. It depends on which material that you use, but I don't think using an ionic liquid necessarily makes it more difficult to understand. No, I, I agree. It's just that it's novel. Yeah, yeah. In some in some cases, it's tricky, but uh, but titanium dioxide was very was very good in that case. Good. Thanks a lot for that. Um, yes, uh, you mentioned a few times in in, uh, in the thesis and also today that uh, the, the common carbon materials. It depends a lot what the source is. Yes. Coconut is very uh, efficient or very good. Yeah. Source. Do you know why? Or why does the, the, the source play such a, a big role? It, I guess it I guess it depends on the on the composition of your biomass. I'm not too but I think for example you have uh, lignin and you have cellulose. And I would guess that if you have a uh, cellulose is is contains more carbons maybe and it's more uh, more, um, it's um, it's a better choice if you want to have uh, if you want to have a high uh, high a good carbon material. But it's but also like all the processes in like it's not not only that you carbonize it when you activate it, you also add uh, activation agent, and the choice of activation agent will also affect uh, the performance. Like um, so, I so I think you would normally have something that is contains relatively little water. Uh, and that this, um, yeah, and then uh, and then I guess it it depends on your process because uh, just spontaneously I would guess the synthetic fabrication route would be possible to optimize and, and yeah give you the perfect uh, um, yeah end product. But yes, you, uh, you you have what they try now is the carb 
carbide derived carbons cdc where you where you actually have the titanium carbide with where you extract the titanium and you can get uh, really like what you like uh, extremely narrow pore size distribution for example so there you can use some kind of sim some uh, synthetic group to really because these activated carbons they you get the quite wide range of, of of everything so that's i think they're looking more into this type of synthetic carbons to really uh, tailor the carbon material thanks a lot uh... I also have a question on this, um, uh, your lithium interactions with the magnesium oxide, magnesium dioxide, um, that uh, in the, in, with your ionic liquids and uh, uh, yeah, exactly, uh, these ones were uh, yeah. Where in the protic ionic liquids, the lithium doesn't seem to be able to, to interact with, with the surface. Yeah. Um, was this surprising? Uh, maybe initially it was a little bit surprising because I'd, I'd hoped that you would see contribution from, from both. Mm -hmm. But then, and we did, and I did this relatively early in my PhD, but maybe now as, as time has passed, I would say that it's not so surprising, especially not when I've been thinking about this diffusion mm -hmm. through the layers, then I think that it makes perfect sense, uh, actually. Uh, um, even though lithium is very, very small? Yeah, even though lithium is very, very small, it will take time, and especially if you already have with this double layer, uh, with this layer that forms with, with almost only protic cations that forms uh, very fast, then you would, uh, I mean, then the, the surface is, is already full. So I, yeah, so it, it's not so surprising after all. But is it, is it a steric hindering or is it site blocking or is it energetic? Or what, what is actually preventing the, the lithium mine to? I think it's a combination of a steric hindering because the, these ionic liquid ions are not, are not that big. Um, so you actually get, and remember, it's not only the lithium that needs to go through. The lithium will also coordinate to the TFSI anions. So it's this, it's this bigger vessel that needs to to move. So I guess it's it's both like a steric hindrance that it actually blocks the surface, and then uh, it's the, um, that it needs to do this like uh, the diffusion, and I and also that the, uh, in an ionic liquid the. Um, the density of the uh, of the um, uh, of the ionic liquid is higher at the interface in the double layers than in the in the bulk, so that could also be that the uh, the the conductivity is lower in the surface, and I think that's yeah, and and then also in, the, in some site blocking with the with the protic ionic liquid. Very good, very nice. Uh, my final question on uh, paper six, and you also mentioned it in, in the thesis. Uh, this uh, capacity for capacity retention and yeah, degradation yeah. here. You said that most likely it was due to the electrode degradation, yeah. but it could also be electrolytes. Yeah. In, in yeah. Decomposition. Yeah. Even though we don't see it, it could be. Yeah. That, that was that was my question. How would you how would you find out? We would probably need to maybe do some kind of um, maybe. Um, Maybe you could actually, um, if you could measure the, the the oxygen or like the oxygen content of your electrolyte. If you use, if you moved away from the cell and used a more a traditional electrochemical cell, um, maybe you could uh, you could measure uh, or even see if some if something is because if you if you would degrade the electrolyte, maybe you would see some kind of. Uh, uh, bubbles or or something at the at the surface, or or if you do exit do characterization of your electrode, maybe you will see if uh, uh, if you if you if you still have VO two or if you transformed it to something else, and then finally, uh, last choice would be to do um, what some flame um, to actually see if you have something dissolved in your in your elect electrolytes. If you have vanadium ions in your electrolyte, then it's probably more of a dissolution uh, problem. Thank you very much. Yeah. Happy with that. Thank you, Bjorn. Uh, we will soon, we will ask the general audience, but maybe first the, the, the additional member, Eva, are you with us? Do you, you want to pose a question or two as well? 
Yes, please. If I may have a short question. Yes. And uh, so thank you. So first of all, uh, I also want to congratulate you on your thesis. And I especially enjoyed the discussion. Um, I learned a lot during this one. And um, I have one question that relates to page 40 and 41. And this has to do with the material morphology and structure and the interaction with the um, electrolyte. And uh, when I look uh, in your papers, and I also look at your images of the electrodes, I'm very curious about the length scale that is of importance for this interaction. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, yeah, that's a tricky, uh, tricky questions. I would say that for supercapacitors, when you when you really cycle it fast, you have really small uh, length scales. So I would say that um, that for for example, uh, thirty two B and C, for example, and and also for the microparticles, they are not they're not ideal supercapacitors. They have a little bit they're a little bit too big uh, to be actually be to be optimized for for supercapacitor use. So ideally, one would have smaller particles because the length scales would be would be smaller when you when you really if you really want to optimize the power density of your of your electrode. But while maybe for the MNO2 composite where they are in the 10 nanometer range, there I think we're closer at, at utilizing the material more efficiently compared to the other ones. So if you and, and then if you think about the surface roughness that you have, because I'm looking at your interface between the electrode and the electrolyte, and I'm thinking about the species, you mentioned the cages that are moving and that they need to have access to the surface. So what again, what is the kind of scale, length scale of that roughness? The if you when you use the, the aqueous electrolyte. I would say that then you can go to very fine roughness then because the ions are so small, so they're not really limited by, by roughness or, or pore size even. So, so then I think you can use very, uh, very small features because the ions are so small. Mm -hmm. but, with the, but with the ions in the ionic liquid, there it becomes a little bit more sensitive because you will have a wettability problem. Maybe we will not, if you have a rough electrode, maybe you will not wet the surface properly if you have a quite viscous ionic liquid so uh, but which lengths i'm that i'm not too sure but do you need i, I know uh, you need to take it into consideration because wettability can be an issue right yeah. so so when you characterize then the surface roughness and the surface area what how do you go about that when you need to get down to about 10 nanometer uh, the surface Area is we, we use this um, uh, N2 absorption desorption BET measurements, and the roughness we haven't really characterized it any more than we looked it looked at it with the SCM and we see how it looks. And it, and for example with with the VO2 material, we we explain the behavior by a, a lower uh, rough of the of one of these materials. But I think that's that's all, also only a part of the. Uh, part of the answer because you're, these are also porous, so so it's um, you can you, you, in this case you see a, uh, you see a, a, a difference which we then attribute to this change in behavior. But I mean roughness is that's that's uh, basically SEM and just to see how the surface looks. Yeah, what I would say. Yeah, right. And and the images that I see in your thesis, we can look at page forty one. Um, then if you look at the scale bars, the ones that gives the, um, the best spatial resolution, you have like the 200 nanometer scale bar. Uh, so if you really need to go down to 10 nanometer, would that be sufficient? I think it's, it's only one parameter that's important. I think you would also... Um, yeah, also look at the pore size distribution and really try to fit it with your electrolytes. So um, uh, I would say that maybe you would need to maybe fine tune, in this case, this, this synth synthesis 
uh, maybe more in depth and maybe more with the with the focus on um, uh, on on also like pore, pore size distribution and then maybe you will end up with a particle that looks more like 32b but will have a a more beneficial uh, pore size distribution than the one in C, for example. So how do you determine the pore size distribution? Um, we, uh, it's the uh, nitrogen gas absorption desorption, a BET analysis. Uh, it's not something that I've done myself personally, but something that we used. Um, so I guess that's where you cool it down and you let uh, nitrogen um, fill up the pores and then you heat it up a little bit and then you measure how m the volume of the nitrogen gas that you have uh, uh, stored in your pores. So then you make an assumption. Uh, yes, uh, that's all, for example, and, and I know and I know that when you read um, people who do a lot of studies on, for example, carbon materials that they are doubting now that maybe BET analysis is not good enough when you look at really, really small pores, for example. So that could be an issue, but uh, it's not something that we have delved any deeper into in this thesis. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we actually have some question uh, from the YouTube chat as well as from Sean Mark. I don't know any Fantastic. third name, but yes. So the question is, what are your opinion on the silver carbon composite layer as the anode presented recently by Samsung? And there's a follow up here. They use five micrometer silver carbon anode and claims an energy density of 900 watt hour per L over L. Uh, it's very funny because we discussed this paper in our group meeting, so it's, that's, a, that's a coincidence. Uh, it is a little bit out of my field, but what I gathered from that presentation is that it looks pretty promising, although the paper in itself maybe has some unanswered questions as far as I understand, but it looks, it looks, uh, it looks promising, especially since a lot of um, people are interested in solid-state batteries these days. Not very high power density, as far as I understand, though. Mm. Okay. Do we have further questions from the audience? Nothing else <laughs> coming up from, no. the, from the chat either, as far as I know. So with this, we, we close the public part of the defense. And uh, we also close the YouTube transmission. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. For being present uh, physically or virtually. And see you soon. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>